Nice tap. Embrace the flavor of life. The way I see it is you've got two choices. You can either keep pretending like nothing bad's ever gonna happen to you, and then when it does, you're saying, uh-oh, or you can get ahead of what's coming so that when it does, not if, you're ready for it, and you're sitting pretty, sipping on Mai Tais next to the pool, working on that Caribbean suntan, because you got it covered. So folks, it's time for you to learn the truth about money. It's time for you to take back control of your money so that you are ready for what's about to happen. By doing that, you're setting yourself up for absolute success. No matter what comes your way, you're ready for it. And that's what I want for you, and I wanna help you with that. So go to chrisnoggle.com and sign up for the Wealth Webinar. We do them every Wednesday at 1 p.m., and you need to be there because it's time. For over 90 years, we've been crash testing our cars in the tireless pursuit of automotive safety. At Volvo, safety's been first since 1927. We've saved millions of lives with the invention of the three-point seatbelt in 1959. At Volvo, we've made driving safer for you and them. Visit safety.finlayvolvo.com to learn more. So they say if you give a man a gun, he'll rob a bank. But if you give a man a bank, he'll rob everybody. The good news for you is Private Money Club runs solely on peer-to-peer -peer relationships, which means no banks allowed. So finally, there's a community for real estate entrepreneurs where it is truly a win-win solution. This community is a place where you can connect with other lenders and other borrowers, and the end results, massive growth for you. You get to build your real estate empire, and you get to do it solving other people's problems. So if that sounds like a place you want to be, well, then join us. Go to privatemoneyclub.com forward slash Kelly. And if you want 500 bucks off, just add the code Kelly500 and I'll knock 500 bucks off the premier membership. We'll see you on the inside. Welcome to the Kelly Cardenas Podcast, where attitude is everything on today's show. You're going to be uh, seeing a huge smile on my face, probably the whole entire episode, um, but especially right now, because I get to be in the studio with uh, one of my heroes, and he had no idea he was a hero of mine. When I went to uh, open my first business, my mom never, if you met my mama, she was never reading uh, any business books, but she read one. And when I went to open my business, she said, look, you need to read this book. You need to read it. You need to understand the concept of it. And it was four simple principles uh, when, when it went into it. It was choose your attitude, play, be present, and make somebody's day. And when I set out to start my company, I actually created the whole entire company. Every one of you out there that was a part of it, you guys were a part of this book, this book that I'm holding on to right now. This is one of the originals. I've got one of the newer editions that's sitting right here too, but this book honestly will change your life. It'll change the culture in your uh, company and it's not about being complicated. It's about being simple. But it was amazing because I was talking with one of my buddies named Greg Reed and I told him about going to Seattle for the first time. And I said, I want to go to the Pike Place Market because I want to see where they throw the fish. And I told my wife this when we went to see an Ed Sheeran concert. And she was like, well, why is it so important to see this market where they're throwing the fish? I said, because my mom gave me a book when I first started my first company, and it was about that fish market and how they uh, were choosing their attitude. They were playing, being present, and they were making people's day. And so I told her that. We went down. We got to see it. I got back. I told my uh, buddy Greg, hey, I went to see the fish market. I told him, he's like, you're joking, right? I said, no. He said, you know the reason why I got into the personal development uh, uh, industry in the first place? And I said, why? And he said, because of the book Fish. And I said, no way. And I said, that is one of my favorite books. It's, it's what I set my whole business on. And then he's like, hold on for a second. And so he texted the author, Harry Paul, who's in the studio with me right now, one of the top speakers and authors in the world, Mr. Harry Paul. Welcome to the show, my man. Oh, thank you. Glad to be here, Kelly. <laughs> it's going to be a fun time. I want to hold this up the whole entire time and just tell people, like, seriously, and, and it, what I loved about this is even the cover did the second principle, which was play. Like, I'm going to jump around if you're okay with that. Sure. Um, because that's the part that I just talked to Larry Kasanoff. Um, Larry Kasanoff was the uh, producer of True Lies, um, Dirty Dancing, Platoon. Um, uh, what else was he? Uh, Mortal Kombat. Um, and he talked about playing. And 
why is that so, why is that so important? But it's the part that we miss out on when we start to get a little older. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. You think about kindergarten, first grade. As a kid, your whole life evolves around, revolves around play. But somehow it's beaten out of us as it, we've gotten older. Think about as you've gotten older, your parents probably told you, Mom, I want to go out and play. No, why? Well, you, you didn't do your chores. Mom, I want to go out and play. Dad, I want to go out and play. No, you didn't do your homework. You know, I want to go out and play. Okay, you can go out and play. But first, change into your play clothes. See, all of a sudden, play became something, let's call not desirable. Because think about that old school uh, th way. If you're playing, you're not working. Mm. And this is about bringing play into the work process, not instead of, into the work process. Because... You know, you could have Taco Tuesday and Freaky Shirt Friday, but there's so many tacos you could eat and so many freaky shirts you can wear. It has to be part of the process. And you said you went to the Pike Place Market. Yes. They throw fish. Why do they throw fish? Because it's fun? Yeah. But think about it. It's, uh, tw I think it's what, about 1,200 square feet? Yeah, Most successful. tiny. Yeah, I mean, it's tiny. Most successful retail space in America. And so the fishmongers are not behind the counter. Some are, but most of them are in front. They're kind of talking to the crowd, talking to the customers, building a relationship. Then you say, you know what? I'm going to have that king salmon for $40 a pound. And they go, great. And I'm taking you on an airplane today. Fine. They pick it up and they throw it to someone behind the counter. When they throw it, they go, uh, uh, fillet a salmon flying away to Minnesota. Now, everyone who's working at the market yells back, one filet of salmon flying away to Minnesota. So you have closed-loop feedback. Everyone knows what has to happen to the fish. So they're preparing the fish. You're out there building a relationship, and it was fun to see them throw the fish. So they brought fun into the process. That was kind of like the eye-opener for people. Yeah, I could figure out a way of having fun with what I do. And being a speaker, going all over the world, hearing different stories, different types of audiences, uh, they kind of figure it out after a while. <laughs> you have to push, but they figure it out. Well, when you go through like these, these four principles, right? Choose your attitude. Uh, and when I was reading, I reread it again. I had read it many times, but I reread it again in the last couple of weeks. And um, this choose your attitude thing, I, I, I was channeling you this morning. I was speaking to some kids and a uh, kid said, told me about their scenario and they were like this is why I'm not happy and then I had to go to Harry Paul which it sucks once you read your stuff because it becomes so simple like business becomes so simple when you choose your attitude when you play when you're present and when you make somebody's day is there any business out there that couldn't use those four principles to be able to go to the next place I've been racking my brain over that one for 20-something <laughs> years because, you know, I talk about it and people ask me in the seminars. Now, I've had some interesting uh, audience members, you know, FBI agents, uh, military people, engineers, uh, engineers, you know. <laughs> <laughs> one time I did this and I talk about anyone can figure out a way of playing, right? And an engineer, and I always leave my number and my email address in my books yeah. and in my seminars. If you look in the back of those two books, my uh, contact information is there because I want people to contact me. And I get a, uh, um, uh, an email saying, Mr. Paul, I love that stuff on play. Could you tell me how to play at work? And I go, what do I do with this poor guy? And I didn't know how to answer him. And then he goes, Mr. Paul, you know, another day goes by. I'm still waiting for those uh, bullet points on how to play. I go, okay, I got it. So I sent him a whole page of bullet points. Just <laughs> the bullet points. Do you find that when you do that, though, that sometimes that takes the fun out of actually playing? When, Like, it, it, if you have to structure how to have a good time, are you actually having a good time? No. You can't mandate, <laughs> you can't make a, you can't mandate fun, and you can't have a matrix that analyzes the fun after there's fun. It has to be organic, oh. and everyone that's in, involved, everyone that's in the group, everyone's in the company, yeah. their ideas of fun has to be had, heard, 
and used because what's fun for you may not be fun for me. But if we all have our ideas in there, we're able to, you know, I'll go along with that. You'll go along with me. And it, it gets it organic. Uh, when I do my presentations, I say, okay, I want everyone at their tables in the next five minutes come up with 25 ways of having fun at work. And I will test you because it has to be part of the work process. And you hear the groans and moans. And, you know, sometimes they get 25. Sometimes they get 10. Sometimes they get, you know, five. And I said, but could you imagine if you did this with your whole group you would have hundreds of different ways of having fun. And I, I said, if you get stuck, you have experts at fun, a lot of you at home. They're called your children. Let's face it, they're freeloaders. They're the gift that keeps on receiving. <laughs> Put them to work. Mom and dad want some ways of having fun at work. And they'll say, how many do you want? They're experts at it. Use that resource. And, and, and then another thing, you brought up the four parts. Yeah. And I always looked at the four parts as two each. Choose your attitude, right? And yeah. play. You can't play with a bad attitude. Think about it. Maybe if you're a ball player, you know, professional athlete. But you cannot play with a bad attitude. It I takes everybody down around you. Exactly. And then if you try to help get somebody out of that bad attitude, their bad attitude is still there. And who has a bad attitude now? You do. How hard is this with having concepts like you, like you have, right? And you're speaking about it, things like that. How hard is it to actually, because you get called to the table on these things at times, and I'm sure you being, you know, having relationships, having children, all of this stuff. How often does Harry Paul get called to, the, like, when you lose your religion? Meaning, the other day I was, I got up, I was a little bit late, I put on a shirt, and it had been left in the washer by me for a little bit too long before I went in the dryer, so it was funky. And then, Harry, as I walk out, I step in dog pee on my carpet. At that point, I, I, I motivationally speak throughout the world. I lift people up. I talk about attitude. I talk about these things. And at that point, I wanted to punch someone in the face. But I got called to the table by my family and saying, like, well, if you're going to say that on Instagram or you're going to say that on your podcast, aren't you living by Do you get called to the table on your own principles? Uh, not so much from the family because our, our kids, see, uh, Fish came out in 2000. Okay. And um, our kids were born in the late 80s. So this kind of helped us raise the children. Okay. Uh, but do I get called on it? Not really. More with myself like you did. Yeah. You know, like. Uh, uh, when did you screw up the last time? And then you had to go back to the principles. Well, I'll give you an example. You used the dog example. <laughs> you know, a week and a half ago, we had to put down one of our dogs. It's a horrible, gut-wrenching thing. Yeah. And, 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 you know, two things happen. You, you lose a dog and you have a vet bill that's like, what? So what happens to your attitude? Then where did I go? Wow. I, look at. Thinking back of those 13 years we had with that dog, how much fun he's been and how he re interacted with our other dogs. So that changes the things because when you think about attitude, it's a choice. Yeah. And you get to make that choice every day. I mean, when you wake up in the morning, I, like me, you look in the mirror and say, wow, today's going to be a great day. <laughs> yeah. Wow. And, and then if you do that, what happens? It starts your mind going down, yeah, it's going to be a great day. Um, uh, I, I heard this uh, seminar, but I think it's, it's a, a, a Navy SEAL admiral named McMasters. And he says about making the bed perfectly in the morning because you start out that way. Yeah. Well, that's the same thing as looking in the mirror and say, today I'm going to be magnificent. And your mind goes, oh, okay, well, we're going to be magnificent today. It's, the, it's what you tell. You could think about, oh, we just lost the dog, or, man, I'm thinking about those 13 years we had. Uh, look in that mirror and choose that attitude. You go into work, take a cleansing breath before you walk through the door. Because how, think about how your attitude is projected when you are around people. They can tell instantly when you're in a bad mood. Kind of like your job. And then the other thing is, think about how few of choices we have today. We don't have a lot of choices. Uh, help me help me with that. Attitude's one. 
help me with that not not having a lot of choices where some people would say well, I, I could be iPhone or Android actually you shouldn't be Android um, I but, agree yeah you agree so we can agree on that buddy rushing if you're listening which I know you are you should stop uh, with the Android stuff but there's a lot there are a lot of places where we're posed with choices where where does that See, I don't look at Android versus Apple as a big choice. I look at attitude as a choice. You're going to make it a good day or bad day. You're going to make someone's... Uh, th okay, so you could bring joy into the world. You can bring aggravation. That's a choice. Wow. You can have a great customer experience or you can have a bad customer experience. There's no in between, right? Mm -hmm. It was a good customer experience, but it was okay. Okay is not great. Okay is good enough but it's not great. So those are important choices. And what do you sell? You don't sell a product, you sell an experience. The fish market, do you know there are three other fish markets down there selling the same fish for the same price? It was only a book written by one, it's only a video about one. And it, is the fish any better? No. Is the price is any better? No. What's the difference? Experience. Mm -hmm. That's what you sell. How do you elevate the vibe? Like, and when I, when I refer to vibe, it's the way that someone feels when they walk away from the experience, right? And so when you look at that, I went there, my vibe, the vibe was completely different. I went to those fish markets that were right next door. I mean, I just went just recently. And if you get a chance to be able to go, go. But I got to go and see Ed Sheeran too. I think one of the greatest performances I've ever seen in my life. Um, but how does a person elevate the vibe around them? I, if I understand your question, is what you project? No, the way that someone feels. Like, say, say, um, I felt your vibe right when we got on the phone, right? When I called you. I called you. I was so excited because you're a hero of mine. You're a hero of mine. I've applied it. I built a multi-million dollar business because of you and four principles. You know, I do put my pants on one leg at a time, Kelly. Okay. So, but, <laughs> but you can imagine, for me getting the opportunity to talk to you, I'm freaked out. I'm like, wow, this is so amazing. This is a hero of mine. I get on the phone and you make me feel like the spotlight's on me. And you made me feel like a million bucks. And I was thinking, like, so I, I was, the way that I walked away feeling, I felt lifted up. I felt empowered. I felt all those things. How do you create that? Well, I think, I think it's our job to be a good listener and to make people feel special. Why do I want to keep on talking about myself? I know it about myself. It's all about getting to know someone else and, and, and feeling what and understanding what makes them uh, excited and happy and what they get out of bed for in the morning. So I, I think that's how I do it. Uh, but especially being a good listener. Uh, I, and, and it's a work in progress. It's difficult for all of us, but we have to be good listeners because most of the time if we're listening effectively um what do we do we hear what we have to do we hear the answers and i learned this from ken blanchard he called it the ear model and very easy to remember e is extrapolate get as much information acknowledge what you've heard okay i make sure i got it right then respond because how many times when you're having a conversation, you might be telling about a trip you and your wife took and how exciting it was to walk through the, and go through the canals of Venice or wherever, and the other person goes, oh, but, 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 you know, I was just in London and they talk right over the top of you because what they have to say is more important than what you're saying right now. That's not being an effective communicator. Get people excited about who they are. Um, then you'll get excited about who you are. How were you able to foster this? Because you, you understand the, par uh, this, uh, the parable of the seed. So you take the same seed and you drop it on gravel, you drop it on a place where there's a lot of weeds, you drop it on fertile soil. It grows different in the places. So it's not the seed, it's the actual soil. So when you start to become aware of these type of principles, right? Listening, you're from the East Coast, right? So East Coast is very strong moving forward. But... What was the soil that your parents or that you, the environment that you're around and the principles that you had that set you up to be fertile for the type of seeds that came in? Because a lot of people could take the choose your attitude, 
They could take the play, be present, and make someone's day. They could take those, but it will land on rocky soil, and it won't ever grow. It grew with you. What was the soil that caused that? That was a good analogy, actually. Yeah. You should write a book. I should. <laughs> actually, one just came out. You can check it out today. It's called The Vibe. There we go. That's the shameless plug, uh, Harry. <laughs> um, I was very fortunate. Uh, none of the things that we are talking about did I do when I was younger. Really? Really. Uh, wasn't a good listener. Wasn't a good boss. I owned my own company. Uh, uh, I, I just, it wasn't good at it. And then two guys came to me with this book project that I looked at and go, what? Okay. I'll, and I was doing book printing at the time or packaging. I designed the cover, the text, and I create a book yeah. for them, print it. Well, they came to me with a book called The One Minute Manager. <laughs> and it started out once upon a time. That's the first line in the book. And and they're telling me it's a business book and it's going to be a great success. And I go, yes, that'll be $7,500 for 5,000 copies. I'll take it in cash. I don't trust you guys. <laughs> <laughs> I, it wasn't that far. Uh, but uh, they asked me if I would take 10% of the book in lieu of the 7,500 bucks. And I said, no. Uh, who knew? Parables weren't big then. Business books were texts, you know, tomes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that book went cra I printed four editions of that book before the uh, William Morrow picked it up. And you didn't take the 10%? No, I did not take the you 10%. You took the 7,500? Yes. What would the 10% be worth? You know, a few million dollars. Okay. But would I have gotten fish? <sighs> so I'm happy. Yeah, yeah, of yeah. course. Uh, and so I got to be friends with Ken Blanchard. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to say he's a mentor or he was somebody I aspire to be like, but he has such an attitude and such a caring for other people. I said, yeah, that guy's on to something. And I said, you know what? I can do that stuff too. And I remember... I would travel all over with him because I was managing his speaking and his uh, publishing when I worked at the Ken Blanchard companies. And I see him up there and I, I go, you know what? I can do what he does. And then, but I didn't have the opportunity or anything. And then Fish comes out. When you're a best selling author, they want you to do what? Speak. And I said, I'm going to be more like Ken, but my own way. Uh -huh. And and I, this is funny because the first time I started doing this, I started acting like Ken up there. Oh. And someone said, where were you? I go, what do you mean, where was I? I was right up there uh, speaking there. That wasn't you. <laughs> and I go, really? They go, yeah, I want you. I like you. I like your personality. I like your sense of humor. I want you up there. It's like the light bulb goes off. And from that moment on, I enjoyed speaking and was good at it. Well, talk to us about the fish, uh, the fish opportunity, because the fish opportunity didn't come wrapped in the way that you would think. It didn't come as far as, you know, because uh, I think a lot of times people think that opportunity, they hear, they see a vision and they're like, oh, the opportunity is going to come. It's going to be wrapped in gold and it's going to be a perfect scenario. And then I'm going to say yes to it and then it's going to move on. How did the fish thing come about? <laughs> then people wake up and go, what? <laughs> come on. Um which is funny because at, when that happened and the success happened, all my friends said, oh, man, you sat your ass down in butter or uh, you were lucky. Uh, no, I saw an opportunity made something of it. Just what you said. Uh, so working with Ken, I was doing a lot of first reading. People always wanted Ken to be a co-author. So the, the fish video came out first, which I know is a little backwards, usually the book, then the video. And it was Ken loved it. And he started promoting it in his seminars. He was doing a lot of public seminars called Lessons in Leadership all over the country. And people were, couldn't believe that video. And they couldn't print them fast enough. So when, when that was happening, Ken, they wanted Ken to co-author the book because they wanted to do a book after the success of the video. So he, they sent it to him. They got around me, which was pretty good. He read the book and he goes, I don't like this book. 
but he sent it to his agent, Margaret McBride. She goes, I don't like this book. And he goes, Harry, read it. Tell him I'm not interested. So I said, Ken's not interested. I called him up. Ken can't say no, I can. That was part of my job description. And they go, why? I said, Ken didn't think there was life in it. He didn't like the parable. Margaret said the same thing. I read the same thing. Uh, Ken's not involved. There's no life. So they took that as uh, feedback to go rewrite the book. It was a 40-page manuscript at the time. It wasn't flushed out. So they did that. They sent it. I said, Ken, they sent it back. He goes, I don't have time. And he goes, read it and tell me what you think. I said, Ken, I read it. I know what I'd do if this was my book and I'd make it a good book. He goes, well, share that with him. So I shared it with the authors. I said, here are the five things, four or five things that I would do if that was my book that would make it a really good manuscript that you could probably sell. And I told them what they were. Things like in the original manuscript, uh, Mary Jane was a... Uh, Mary Jane was a um, divorced woman. I said, make her a widow. I get empathy instantly. She has a great uh, rapport with her boss. Come on. He was supportive of trying something new? No, I need a yin and yang. When, you, when the, I read your manuscript, I can't smell the fish market. I need to smell the fish market. And she goes, and, and I said, there's no mentor in there. She observes and goes back and tries. I need a mentor relationship. And I said, you got to leave him hanging at the end. And he goes, wow, I, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't see that. I go, you were too close. So he goes, be a, a co-author. I go, I'm not a writer. I'm, you know, he goes, no, I want you to be a co-author. I knew why, because I had Ken's black book of publishing contacts. And I turned him down three times. And finally, my wife goes, you always talk about a winner break even bet. Isn't this a winner break even bet? I go, yeah, you got a point there, okay. I said, I'm in, but I'm an equal partner. If I'm an equal partner, you will get everything I have, and I'll bring the Blanchard organization behind me, and I will get you uh, a literary agent. And they said yes. So I went, I, I didn't know if I was going to get it literary agent. <laughs> so I talked to, I talked to Margaret McBride <laughs> and she goes, Harry, if you do that to the manuscript and you're a co-author, I'll rep it. So let's see, the wife is up behind it. Ken said he'll write the foreword. Margaret, uh, you know, Margaret will rep it. I go, eh, I guess it's going to be a winner break even bet. And I said, yes. And I rewrote the storyline. We flushed out the manuscript Margaret looked it over, made some changes, and we, how do we do this? Oh, we took 12 or 13 copies of the manuscript, sent it to the fish market, had them pack it in fish market, Pike Place fish market boxes uh, with smoked salmon and sent it to 13 publishers and three bit. Two of them wanted to do it in a year and a half. One wanted to do it right now, Hyperion. And I... The editor at Hyperion, I've worked with on two of Ken's books, and he is an absolute ace, Will Schwalbe, an absolute ace. And I said, we go with Hyperion. So Margaret's negotiating with them, and she goes, I can get 150 for the book. They offered 150 I go, you're kidding. She goes, why would I kid you? I guess it was a rhetorical question on my part. And she goes, do I have your permission to get more? I said, let me see, Yes. <laughs> And she got 250 for three unknown authors. And I said, that's amazing. And uh, kind of the rest is history. Oh, so when Hyperion, <laughs> when we accepted Hyperion, they, sent, uh, they went to uh, and sent us uh, boxes of bagels because we sent them smoked salmon. <laughs> so you, let me get this straight. You weren't even, a, <clears throat> before this book, you weren't even an author. No. But you seized an opportunity that came about. How can, how can a person start to recognize opportunity around them? I, I don't know. It, it wasn't a feeling. Okay. To me, I looked at it as, wow, this could be fun. This could be a challenge. This could be trying something new. I never went to college. Uh -huh. I barely got out of high school. I made a living as a commercial artist, as a printer. Uh, 
and working at Ken, I was doing marketing and sales. So I, why not try something new? You know, it's not like I was a, a trained as a doctor or an engineer. I was always looking for the crease, the seam to, to kind of go through. And so that's probably why I said yes. And, you know, I had prompting and I had, you know, help. You know, my, my wife said yes and, and all that kind of good stuff. And, well, believe me, I had no idea it was going to be this successful. But getting a quarter of a million dollars, I go, wow, my share? Wow, we could pay for our daughter's bat mitzvah. This is going to be good. <laughs> and, and, and um, you know, it comes out, right? Yeah. The, uh, the publisher, they printed four editions before the book was released. Four editions? Four editions? Before it was released. They knew then. They couldn't print them fast enough at one time. Yes, they, they kind of had a feeling. But it came out and it went, da -dun, da -dun, da -dun, da -dun, 300 here, 400 this bookstore chain you know bookstores were big back in 2000 can you explain what a bookstore is to those people out there nowadays <laughs> because it's this place uh that had actual books inside of it it's, it'll blow your mind it's a, it's a big store with shelves and shelves and shelves of <laughs> thousands and thousands of books and you go in there and you browse it's by category you go oh i like this book i'm gonna go to the register and buy it <laughs> That's a bookstore. Well, it's a, it's incredible because I'm sitting with this one. This one is this the third uh, edition? That's the third edition. Okay, so third edition, and this one, if you if you're watching on YouTube, you could see it. If you're not watching on YouTube, it says over six million. And when I said that to Harry earlier, you said there's quite a bit more than that. So we're probably tipping into the ten million uh, uh, copy realm. We're probably getting close if not, if we're not already there. I say we because you're my friend, and so we we do this thing together. Just as long as you ask for the royalties, that's fine. You know what I mean? <laughs> we're, we're all good. So I want to go back to the to the um, to the soil part because you have a, a, a limitless thinking here. My friend uh, Tim Paget from Keen Tech, um, big shout out to him. He was just talking about this the other day. He said, "I like being around people with limitless thinking." And I said, "Well, explain." And he said, "Well, you don't know." that you can't, so you just do. And you weren't an author. You, you were taking care of other people's books. You were making sure that other people's books with the jackets, all the stuff, up comes an opportunity. Most people that are not authors, Harry, say, I'm not an author. That's not in my wheelhouse. You, on the other hand, say, well, let me just try this thing out. And oh, by the way, then I end up selling almost 10 million copies of one of the best business books in the world. Well, what did your friend say? Uh, something do if you never did it? You're, you were just talking about your friend. Yeah, my t friend Tim Paget. He said yeah. you didn't know that you couldn't, so you just did it. That's me. But where does this come? Did your parents? Did your parents instill this? Were no. you in a, a a household where people were telling you that the there's limit, there's no limits, or did you just were you just born that way? I think it, I think I. Uh, I had to be born that way because it, it developed over time. I mean, when I first started my first business, I didn't even know what a credit card or a checking account was. But I knew this was something that looked like I can do. And so I just did it. What examples did you see around you that gave you that type of permission? Because most people are waiting for permission. You know, they're, they're saying that I'm going to start my email list, but there's all these things. And then they go to people who almost solidify their fear as opposed to, you know, Greg calls the difference between advice and counsel. Counsel is someone who's actually done it. Had, was there people around you that you saw and you said, like you saw Ken Blanchard and you, you didn't want to emulate him, but you were like, if this dude could do it, I think I could do it too. Well, I loved his vibe. We talked about vibe. I yeah. loved Ken's vibe and uh, to really experience that uh, working with him and traveling with him. It, he, we'd be in New York. He'd call me at 2.30 in the morning. He says, could you find me a deli that's open now? I'm hungry. <laughs> I says, well, have the car come around down the, you know, meet us at the hotel, the front of the hotel, and I'll find us a deli. That's Ken. So he had that fun vibe. He didn't know he couldn't do it. Uh, but what about even earlier on? Because a lot of times as kids, we get, we come up against opposition, Right. We come up against opposition and, and then we it, it kind of forms us as we go along. And then I, I think about it. My brother and I, my brother had to a lot of times stand in between my two parents fighting. He would push me in the room. I would play. He would be out there sometimes taking a butt kicking because he was stepping in between my mom and my dad fighting him growing up. 
he wanted to scratch the surface of every single thing that somebody said. He wanted to make sure that what you were saying was true because what he had saw was us be this happy family, but there was fighting that he saw. For me, on the other hand, because I was pushed into the room and I was playing with my stuff, I thought that the projection of our family, that's just the way it was. And so I was this guy who, I mean, if you told me uh, Superman was outside and uh, I walked out and he wasn't there, I'd be like, he left. <laughs> So I, I learned that later on, but what kind of things did you, I mean, like your upbringing, like what was it? Because I think that's the part that's so interesting because we, again, we can all be planted with these seeds, Harry, but unless the uh, soil is fertile, it can't grow. But yours grew to an unbelievable realm. Yeah. I'd like to say it was lucky, but it wasn't. There were some luck involved everything has a certain amount of luck i was never a good student okay. i wasn't i have authority issues so i can't deal with anyone why is that i i i guess it's how i'm wired did you have someone domineering over you when you were a kid no my parents were pretty hands off what about teachers did you have someone get in your face and you said like I, i'm uh, that's not going to take it anymore did you have a bully that came along that uh, there was always a little bit of bullying in South Philly, but which I think again, is good. Yeah, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's it stiffens the spine. But I think it was since I didn't wasn't a good student, and I knew what, I wasn't going to go down a path where I learned a, a certain set of skills, mm. like I you know medical engineering, uh, uh, marketing things like that. I always look for the easy way of something I can do, and maybe that's. Well, what age were you when you realized that? Or did, did a teacher tell you? Because I remember one of my teachers telling me that, hey, you know, uh, not in so many words, but basically uh, like this route over here that all these kids are going to major colleges, that ain't going to be for you. So you need to figure something out. And I didn't realize that that was a bit of a limiting belief. I was so glad that I had my parents telling me that I could do anything that I put my mind to. But that could be crushing for a kid. Did you have those kind of experiences? Like, well, yeah, there was some. Like, I always like art. Okay. And I made a living at it, and I still do art today for myself. And I remember when I was in school, I wanted to take the art track in high school, but that's an art academic track, and I wasn't a good student, had lousy grades, so they stuck me in this commercial track. And I go, what's commercial track? Oh, oh you know, you'll become an accountant. Uh I fail math every year. I have a math tutor and can't pass math. And I told this to my art teacher, and he goes, this is unacceptable. And he went down and talked to the counselor and says, he goes into the art track. And I think that's, but that taught me creativity. Ooh. And I've always had that kind of creative knack uh, and went to art school, not college, art school. So I think, that's part of it. And the other thing, you know how I said I always look for the easy? Well, think about having two co-authors. Three is better than one a lot of times. <laughs> so we all made, we all brought something completely different to the table. So it's, it's an author group. Yeah. And I knew I could survive in that environment. Who was a guiding light for you growing up? Like uh, my friend James Dixon, one of the top motivational speakers in the world, his Mama told him he was a cripple. He got uh, amputated, his leg got amputated at 11 years old after 33 surgeries. And they amputated and didn't even tell him they were going to do it. So at 11 years old, he goes into surgery, which is it's normal for him because he had 33 before. They cut off his leg and he wakes up and his leg is gone. His mom then tells the nurse, don't tell him any lies that he could do all these things. He's nothing but a cripple. And she looks at him and says, you're a cripple. You better say it. And he won't say it. And then she smacks him across the face and forces him to say, okay, mama, I'm a cripple and I'll never be anything else. But his grandmama said, no, you're a superhero. You've got a bionic leg that makes you a superhero. You're a superman. He chose to believe that guiding light. And now he's one of the top motivational speakers in the world. But that was a guiding light right? Was there a guiding light for, was there someone that, that you remember, like, and we want to know their name. Um, was there that, was there a person for no. you? No. Was there a movie? No. That's you didn't watch Rocky. You're from Philadelphia. Oh, of course I watched Rocky. Did you resonate with Rocky? 
I, I thought there was a lot of phantom punches in it. <laughs> 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 oh, yeah, absolutely. I resonated with it. Because uh, it was kind of underdog. Yeah, and I knew those places. And Ken, it's, uh, the area in Philadelphia is called is Kensington. Yeah. Different than the Kensington in San Diego. Okay. Uh, it's a tougher neighborhood. And, but I knew that pet store. I knew where he was and, and all the different sites. Uh, but no, and, and it's funny you asked that particular question because for Father's Day, my daughter gave me a present. It's called Story Worth. And it's, you write a book about your life and each week they send you a question and you write about that. You know, uh, how were you in school? Who, who, what was your uh, childhood friends like? Uh, uh, what do you like about your dad? What do you like about your mom? Your grandparents? Who's your favorite person? Who was the kindest to you? This week's question was, who inspires you the most? And I go, I don't know. I don't <laughs> have an answer. Lots of people. I bring it from everybody. What were some of the things that, like, mom and dad taught you early on? Maybe it, it wasn't even the, the, the sayings that they said, but maybe you watching them that helped you to be able to create uh, the, the type of, I mean, you really truly have a limitless mentality and it's, it's unbelievable to be able to see it. I mean, my, I heard it when I talked to you on the phone the first not time. Not my parents, nothing. The only thing my dad ever said to me that resonated was, I don't want you to be a truck driver like me. What about the... And I the, wanted to be a truck driver. Did you see a work ethic with him? Did you see a work ethic with mom? Did you see things that maybe they didn't say, but they, you saw him do? They, they worked hard. You know, my mom worked in a dress shop. My dad drove a truck. Um, but they always believed that you have to work and, and you know... Uh, be a good provider. Yeah. But so I, 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 that I got, but nothing else. My parents never graduated high school. You know, huh. uh, my dad was 20 years old. The war breaks out. You know, two days later, he's, you know, signed up to go fight the war and marries my mom when she's 18, right out of high school at towards the end of the war and, you know, start a family. So uh, they didn't have a lot to offer. Um, so, no, I, I guess I'm kind of homegrown. No, I, I think it's, I think it's incredible that way too. Yeah. But how, how is the impact on the children, like on your children? Because if you were Michael Jordan's son, you shouldn't play basketball. Does that make sense? Yes. Right. LeBron's son. I, I, it's, we're excited about him playing basketball, stuff like that. Most likely he's not going to have the impact that LeBron did. When you have a dad like you, that's an absolute icon, one of the top authors in the world, one of the top speakers in the world, like, do the kids go into the family business? No. Um, we raised our kids to be totally independent. We raised them on the fish philosophy about attitude. Okay. Uh, in fact, when we would go to the zoo, you know, we don't go to the zoo anymore because once you go on safari, you never step foot in a zoo. And... We would take him to the San Diego Zoo, which is a great zoo, and we'd say, okay, look at all those people yelling at their kids. We're not yelling at you. You could do anything you want, just as long as you don't break a zoo rule or you don't do anything dangerous. Other than that, go have fun. My, our kids had great times at the zoo because if they wanted to walk around like a monkey or ape the monkeys or, or eat ice cream and put it on the top of their head. I don't care. Do whatever you want. You're not going, you're not crawling in with them, <laughs> but you can do whatever you want. That was our zoo. We raised them on a zoo mentality. We wanted them to enjoy everything that we did with them. So for us, it was, you make your own way. My, my son at 16 started a poker, 14, 14, that's a, a poker tour in Poway, which is where our, our we yeah. raised our kids. And they had a poker table, real, you know, ceramic 11.2 gram chips, and and they would have root beer and pizza, and he had a poker tour. So we kind of like gambling. So he goes to UNLV and gets a degree in gaming management. <laughs> Our daughter is takes after my, uh, my wife, who's a, a retired RN, and so she's more empathetic. She's more helpful. Well... She works at Rady Children's Hospital doing psych evals in the, emerg uh, the psych emergency room. You know, she, she was really smart. She got her uh, bachelor's, got her master's at NYU, and she has a, a, a great job and a you know, great husband and all. So uh, we raised our kids to 
follow your dream, be in, but independent. Uh. I mean, we, I, we, my wife and I, we will not rescue our kids. We will give to our kids because we want to, uh-huh. not because we have to. And they know that. How do these things apply in marriage? Because what I've noticed, and uh, we, we didn't cross this before we started recording, Harry, but the personal development or self-development um, industry most of the time ends in divorce. What I you see. Mean people in our industry. Yes. Wow. So if you look at it, a lot of times you go to personal development conferences a lot of times guys are on their second. I'm not judging because I'm on my second marriage, second, third, fourth, or sometimes on the out. And it's like they personally develop, but then this is the the formula that I see. They personally develop. So they develop these skills and they go and they do it. And then they're like, Oh wow, my wife isn't growing with me. So I need to leave her and find someone who will be in line with these new. And I'm like, are you kidding me? I never was that deep. (laughs) It was why me and my brother were talking about this. And we were like, you know, a lot of times we see speakers and I hear you talk about your wife, you know, but a lot of times we see speakers that are talking about communication and presenting on leadership and communication and all these things. And meanwhile, they're, they're not living that. It's the cobbler's kids who go without shoes. Yeah. Um, Although my dad did tell me that one. <laughs> okay. How, how did the, these things translate into your marriage? Like, I, so I, I'll, I'll tell you what. When, when I made a commitment to marry Mary, I made a commitment to make a marriage work. And that's it. We're committed to making the marriage work. Do we have bumps and, and, and speed humps and U-turns and curves? Absolutely. We're normal, of course. But we were committed to making a marriage work. I mean, suppose you went to a therapist and he goes, uh, are you committed to making this marriage work? Oh, I'm not sure. Okay, save the money and go to the attorney. <laughs> so I think if you, can't, if you can't get by that commitment, and then like with kids, uh, you, you decide whether you're going to have kids before you get married. Uh, my wife's Catholic, I'm Jewish, so we decided how we were going to raise the kids before marriage. How'd you decide? How, how'd you pick? I said they're going to be Jewish. <laughs> uh, but my wife said, okay, but if we raise them Jewish, we will raise them Jewish, and you will be a, a hands-on. And I go... Well, that's fair. If I want him that way, I better be part of it. Okay. And we did it. You know, so it, that, I guess, is a give and take and open communication yeah. right there. So, yeah. We, and we saw, and that was before, not, not, not after you're married. You know, m- when my daughter and uh, her husband, when they were talking about getting married, they had their, what did they call it? They're must-haves or, uh, you know, things that they, they both need and both want. And if the, it goes like this, yeah, well, and they got married. I'm sure there was little things. You know, my, my daughter's never been on a motorcycle. He likes to ride motorcycles. She has a helmet and she goes with him once in a while. My daughter's a vegan. Well, guess what? He's a vegan, but he's allowed to cheat when he's not with her. <laughs> no, no meat in the house. You know, so they, they, and my wife and I had the same thing. You, you, you figure out if you're committed to something, you, you make it work uh, where you're both. Because uh, uh, think about what you're talking about. A lot of times it's one has to dominate the other. Yep. That does not work. Mm. It doesn't work. So, you know, and, and uh, you know, next September will be 40 years, so something had to work. <laughs> 40 uh, years? Yeah. That's amazing. So what's the, well, like, obviously you just gave us the, the blueprint for it, you know? I mean, being able to go back and look at it. Taking, a, taking us behind the curtain, because I think a lot of times, and I want to shift this, because... A lot of times people think, look at marriage, but they don't look at the, the inside of it. They, they look at, oh, wow, I'm going to have this amazing um, engagement party. I'm going to have this incredible wedding. But what you were talking about is the foundational parts. 
take us behind the scenes in the the book industry because a lot of people look at the book industry and they're like, oh wow, I want to write a book. I've always wanted to write. It. Every time that you show that you wrote a book, I can guarantee you have ten people come up to you and be like, oh, I'm working on a book and you're like how many pages you got done and they're like none and they're like uh, you know I've never done anything but I got an idea take us behind the 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 curtain as far as what it takes to write a book and because just like the music industry and we were talking about it earlier most people don't understand the the inner workings of it and how how it it comes to be well as we, we you and I were speaking earlier and we, t- and we were talking about, you know, that pass along value. Mm-hmm. And I think the first thing you have to do when you're thinking about writing a book, is there a book in you? Is there a message you're trying to give people? Is there something, it, it's a novel that you want to share with somebody that has maybe some life lessons or some excitement in it. And if that's there, then okay, well, I, I got it. That's that seed you're talking about. Where are you going to throw that seed after that? Well, I have these skills. I have this great idea. I have the great storyline, but I'm really not good at prose and dialogue. Let me go find somebody who is. They're out there. They might not have that creative skill, but they have that writing skill. Oh, together, you can come up with something good. So you have to come up with that manuscript that you believe in. Then what do you do with it? And you can go three routes, I believe, today. Okay. One is you get, get a, a literary agent uh, interested in it, and they will go to New York, use their contacts to sell it to a publisher. The other is you can try to send an unsolicited manuscript to a publisher. That's kind of difficult. Okay. How th- difficult? Like if we put it, if we put numbers on it, are we talking lottery difficult or are we talking? Not lottery difficult, but uh, a, a lot of them on their website may say, may say no unsolicited manuscripts. Got it. Uh, so it's pretty easy to find out. And the third is to self-publish. Okay. Uh, some great books were self-published at first. One Minute Manager was self-published. It was? Yes. Okay. It was self-published, and then they took it? I did the first four editions self-publishing. Okay. William Morrow picked it up. Did you market it to them? No, a uh, literary agent okay. did. How do you get a literary agent? Uh, really simple. Just go online. Okay. Look for the literary agents in your area first. Maybe you know, look for the ones in New York. Look to see what type of books they represent. Okay. You know, if you see everything that's uh, in self-help or, 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 or novels, uh, don't try to sell a children's book to them. You know, make sure that they, uh, and then send them the manuscript. And believe me, they get a lot. Uh-huh. So you better figure out a way of standing out somehow. Why did we pack our book in a Pike Place fish market box with smoked salmon? We wanted to get a look. So you have to get a little creative with it. And if they bite, they'll take it to New York. Because if they don't believe in your book, they're not going to take it to their contacts that they developed over the years. Mm. Because those contacts know that they don't bring them junk. A a book that not many people talk about. Um, Everyone talks about good to great. They all talk about that one. But the follow-up book no one talks about which is called How the Mighty Fall. Right. Now, Good to Great was a big red book, and every, it was in every airport that you can imagine, and they talk about these companies and all these things. How the Mighty Fall was a small black book, and in that black book, it actually chronicled 75% of the companies that said Good to Great actually fell, and they chronicle why they fell. And one of them was a word that I didn't understand what it, was, what it meant when I read it for the first time. It was called hubris. You experienced hubris, when you went on to the second book. Was it the second one? Was it Rev with the second one? Well, it, uh, it was the fifth book, fifth but book. the first book out of the Out of the fish. fish. Out of the yes. fish one. So th- take us into that because a lot of times when we start, when, I mean, wildly, incredibly, like over the moon, this is, I believe, one of the best business books of all time. I believe. The reason why is because I have a personal testimony and I created, I mean, honestly, like... A kid that barely graduated from high school was able to create a, a multi-million dollar business all over the country based off of very simple principles. 
you went into that fifth book, The Rev, and we were talking about it earlier, yeah. and you even just laughed about it. You laughed it off, and then you just moved on. Like, how do you, number one, set yourself up that not everything is going to be fish, and then how do you continue on and continue to grow from that point? I, I think it's because you start out thinking it's going to be as good as fish. <laughs> You did everything that you th thought you did in fish. You know, you try to do everything right. And audiences are very fickle. Why? Why? I guess it's an easier question. Why did fish succeed? Don't you think that's an easier question? It's an easier question, but that's why I don't ask you that question. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're going to answer it anyway. Okay, so <laughs> why did it succeed? Okay. First, it was ninth. It was two thousand. Okay, and we just got out of a recession, or we were in a recession, and I think people wanted to get back to work, have some fun, and enjoy what they're doing. And it's a book, a business book based on play. Got it. Okay, so I, I think that's the big reason why we were able to get some play out of it. And you've been to the market; you know how lively that is. Oh my gosh! Well, John, my co-author. He has a video company, and he was able to capture that in the video. So the market was seeded for us. So you had like a following, and then you had a playful cover and, and a, a good book. You know, Very good. A, a good book. And it limped along. Limped? Yeah. Like how many, how many, like the first week, how many you sell? Probably 500. Did that scare you? No, not at all. Because I, right. I know it's a slow burn. So it, it took three months till we hit the number 15 on the Wall Street Journal bestseller list. And on the back, this was a thing that you, that you, I saw a bit of not pride in a bad way, but you took pride in the fact that there's some words on the back of this book. If you're watching on YouTube, you could see it. If you're listening, it says essential New York Times bestseller. Right. These words were not allowed to be on there until when? So we were in the bestseller list in the print edition of the Wall Street Journal. Not not the Wall Street Journal, excuse me, the New York Times. What's the difference? Like when you hear a bestseller today? Snobbery from the publishers. Cause really? Because we were, before we hit the print edition, we were selling a book a minute. But they still wouldn't put it on there until we hit that print edition. In the, uh, I think it was the self-help how-to or something like okay. that. Yeah, one of those, uh, uh, which is, you know, it's in the print edition uh, yeah. on, on Sunday. So I was like, whoa. Um, yeah. So I, I think it's a little bit of pride and snobbery on the publisher's part. Uh, we knew it was a New York Times bestseller because we were on the print edition pretty quick. What does it take? How many copies do you have to sell in what amount of time? Because this was, this was a blurry thing for me when I, I remember first starting out and, and writing the first book. It, mine became a bestseller the first day out of, of, of my mom. Uh, my, it was a bestseller to my mom because she had not bought any books in that year and she bought that one, so it was a bestseller. Um, so you're not getting that at all here. Yes, I am getting all. it. You're not laughing at all. <laughs> my, my, um. <laughs> my, 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 I, I sent my mom and dad a book. That's, that's, <laughs> it was a bestseller in my family is yes. what it was. Um, but it, there's this kind of almost mystery, right? The, the, or what, Still is. What's the, what's the formula? So you might sell a lot of books, but at a time where a lot of other books are selling a lot of books and it's hard to break onto the list mm. or vice versa. So we hit the Wall Street Journal number 14 or 15. It's only 15 that's in the paper. Uh, the first 15 in the business list. And I thought that was the greatest thing in the world. My name is in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, then it fell right off. And it's selling and selling and selling. The publisher's not panicking. Then I knew an editor at Amazon. It's 2000, Amazon is pretty much a ba uh, bookseller. Yeah. Not the, the retail giant it is today. And this editor loved the book. And... The uh, business, he was a technical editor there. Uh, the business editor liked the book too, and he did a great review. But well, it's sitting there on Amazon. It's not moving much. Uh, and then he goes, this, Charles Decker, this guy I knew there, said, I'm going to get you a PBM. I think peanut butter and jelly, PBM. I don't know what that is. He goes, a pass buyer mailing. Now, what's a pass buyer mailing? He goes, a pass buyer mailing is we profile your book against a very successful book. 
And we send out an email that says, if you like this book, you'll love this book. Mm. Or, you know, so they did it against Who Moved My Cheese, who came out two years before this, which was us. Still to this day, a phenomenon. It probably sold 10 times as, not maybe 10, five times as many as my book. And we sold 7,000 copies in one day. So what does 7,000 copies in one day get you? Number one on Amazon. Thank God I saved the uh, screenshot. <laughs> and it's framed on my wall. I do have some kind of an ego. Uh, then that put it on every bestseller list that did business books. You know, uh, Business Weekly or whatever that was. Uh, 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 Publishers Weekly, uh, Wall Street Journal, uh, New York Times, you name it. If there was a list out there, we were at the top or close to the top because we were always fighting with uh, who moved my cheese and uh, stayed on the Wall Street Journal for six years. That was a tipping point. Yeah. I forget the guy who wrote the tipping point. but I can't remember. Yeah, I know the book. I know the book. That's a tipping point. You always look for those tipping points. That was ours. So how do you, like my, my pops, I called him one time and I, I said, uh, you know, I was talking to him and, and he would always call me boy. He said, boy, what, what uh, number iPhone do you have right now? And I said, uh, I don't know that. I think at the time it was like a nine. And I was like, I think a nine. And he's like, do you know in eight months, six, eight months, that iPhone is going to be obsolete? And I said, okay, like, it doesn't sound too motivating, pop. Like, and he was passionate about it. And he said, but you realize that if you... Uh, study and focus on people. There's never a new version of them. And he said, if you're constantly chasing technology, son, you'll constantly be behind and chasing where if you focus on people and understand their desires, which have never changed since the beginning of time, then you'll always be ahead of the game. And the reason why I say that is because... That's good advice. It, well, my pop was a G. I mean, he was, the, he was the wisest man I've ever met in my life. Like, if you got a chance to sit with my pop, he wished... Because, I mean, my pop was a fan of yours. My pop was a fan... I was raised on Ken Blanchard. And it's, it's amazing to be able to see it. But the reason why I say it is because the principles in your books are timeless. How do you help a generation that is constantly looking at the newest, hottest thing, to realize that if you go back to these basics, literally, like, choose your attitude, play, be present, and make someone's day, like, you could build a tech company on that, you could build real estate on that, you could build anything on that, but it's not shiny. No, it's not shiny, but it's effective, and it's good, and it's like your dad said, uh, you don't have the latest iPhone. You're, you're, you're chasing a ghost, actually. Um, and the principles in the book are evergreen. And remember we were talking about customer experience? Yeah. Uh, experience uh, wins out over technology. I mean, I'm an Apple fan. Although Apple Maps is horrible. <laughs> <laughs> But I'm a, I own stock in the company. I love the company. Everything we have is Apple. Uh, is it that much better than an Android? No. What's the difference? The experience. Have you ever walked in a mall where there was the, I don't think they have them anymore, the Microsoft store and then the Apple store? There was only a line going into the Apple store, not the Microsoft store. It was a different vibe. A different experience. What's that? Well, how can a person create that? Because when you look at it, again, apples for apples, right? So if you look at the Android, the we could argue that one uh, camera is better, but really there. Eh, eh. And so, but then there's this, this almost this magic that you sprinkle on companies. And when you go in to speak that it, it, you sprinkle that magic, you know what it is. What is that? What's the magic? that causes a person to feel different because you feel different when you have an Apple or an iPhone. Well, you know, you have to thank Steve Jobs for that, uh, the way he created that company and created the products that they were going to be beautiful inside and out and the experience was there. But for me, I think we always, uh, you said, how many times have we both said that the principles in the book are simple and you don't need to be a rocket scientist to understand them and say, I can do that. There's not one principle in the book that you can't say, well, that's a little tough for me. Well, maybe attitude is for some people, but some people just have a bad attitude. 
Talk to me about the secret Mickeys in the book too, because you, you alluded to them earlier and you're, you're familiar with the secret Mickeys, like the little trinkets that uh, Disney put in Disneyland that was just as a reminder. We did them in our, uh, in our company and we put um, three birds, stickers of three birds above each door that uh, go, go uh, at the front door and in the back door. The reason why is because whenever you were having a tough day, you looked up, saw the three little birds and the three little birds said, every little thing is going to be all right by Bob Marley. So that was a secret Mickey. No one knew, none of the clients knew, but the staff knew, right? And you talked about it, that the, the woman was not a divorced woman. She was a widow, With right? kids, and she was With abandoned. And like, how, could they, how could that guy die and abandon her? So talk to us about some of the more about some of those secret Mickeys that you put in the book that while we're reading through, we feel it, but we don't know why we're feeling it. Or are you allowed to take us behind the curtain of Oz? Oh, sure. I, I mean, I think on the uh, on the, the edition you have there, the uh, blue edition, not the orange one, it says work made fun gets done. I think that's one of them that, wait a minute, you know, I could have fun at work. So I think that's one, if I read Secret Mickey's correctly. Well, well also, too, like the little things, the details that you put in that – Maybe weren't the, the, the principles, because, you know, obviously we see the principles that choose your attitude, the play, be present, make, uh, make someone's day. We see those things. But say, for instance, with us, music was a big part of our environments when we built environments. And the reason why is because I had a woman come in one time and the, our uh, sound system went out. And so I said, well, just put it on a radio station. But I asked to put it on a Christian radio station because I thought no one could be offended by Christian radio, whatever. She starts listening to it and she's like, oh, this is uh, me and my son's song. And I said, oh, I chose the right station. Then two minutes later, she starts crying. And I'm like, I thought you said this was your son. And she said, my son just passed away yesterday. So now what I did is I took her experience in our business and turned it into her losing her son. So when she walked away, she couldn't focus on the experience at all. She lost it. Uh, and, and it was just because the music, it was that little secret Mickey. So what we did is we took the music and we made it non-lyrical, foreign, or unpopular, so no one knew what it was. And the only time you would ever hear it was in our environment. It became the background, and it didn't become the emphasis, because I didn't want to evoke a positive or negative emotion when the person came in. When you look at the book in, as, you re as you wrote it, and as you crafted the story, what were some of those things that you wanted people to feel, but you weren't so much telling them how to feel? I think the biggest one was the excitement of the fish market because it was very easy to do that in a video, but it was much more difficult to do it in the book. Um, so that I, I would think that would be one. The other is how, I guess it's how her kids helped her along with her attitude. Because um, I never thought of it the way you're asking. And I probably would have to go back and look at those hundreds of letters people sent to me and sent to my co-authors that said how we've changed their life. Because I'm sure they're referring to one of those secret <laughs> Mickeys that I just can't put my finger on right now. How do you, you said, you alluded to it earlier, you said that you had to smell the market. Yes. How do you make someone smell something while reading a book? Which I did last night. I was reading, I was going over it again last night, and I was at the fish market. Word pictures. How do you create word pictures? Uh, you know, you don't have to be, you know, uh, smell has no memory. You know exactly what chocolate smells like, but you can't smell it right now. You can't go, yeah, it smells just like chocolate. <laughs> but you know exactly what chocolate smells like so you, i think you can do that in the book you know the excitement and the excitement it, it was the the guys having excitement and, and fun with themselves and bringing the audience into the fun because that's probably another secret mickey no one wants to watch other people having fun they want to be part of it the fish market does that so at work you can't have two people having fun and everyone else watching them you have to include everybody in the fun and everyone's idea in the fun. Um, and, and I think that, that that's one of the things that that book really helped people understand. And it's creating those good word pictures. Um, you, you could see it in books where there's a, a, a love story 
and, and you just know that these people really care and feel about each other. That's when you know a writer knows what they're doing. What about, take me to the, the friendship parts, and again, I'm going to go backwards a little bit, where not everything comes in the package that you think is going to come in. So we have a vision. You have a vision for your life when you're a kid. It doesn't come in that package, in that opportunity. And one of the uh, ti- uh, one of the times that I'm talking about is you sat next to a guy on an airplane that spilt, you spilled a drink on him or he spilled a drink on you, and that's the reason why you and I are in the room together right now. How important is it to foster those relationships and be open at the at those particular times? I'll give you I'll give you an example that'll really cement this very very well. Uh, if you remember, I mentioned I got a PBM from Amazon, <laughs> and I mentioned the person's name Charles Decker. Uh huh. Well. He worked for a company called Barrett Kohler, which is a publisher in San Francisco, now Oakland. And they, um, they wanted to do a series of like dollar books with Ken's Mickey's, <laughs> right? Little, little nuggets for a dollar, you know, could be 10 pages. So Ken loved the idea because, and especially nowadays, it's, we're in a soundbite society, uh, and so he goes, work with them, work with Charles, get this thing done. I go, okay. And then all of a sudden, this is when, you know, let's say faxes and voicemail were the only ways of communicating with people uh, or snail mail, and he ghosted me. And here I got my boss saying, get something done, and the person I have to do it with is ghosting me, so who's in the middle taking the heat? Me, and... I didn't know what to do, so I go, you know what, Ken? He's been ghosting me. I know you want this done, but I, there's something. I just can't do anything with it, so I'm going to send him a nasty note. He goes, don't. He goes, that's okay. We'll figure out another way, and he did. We, we went a different direction, and he was the one that got me that pass by our mailing that sold 7,000 copies in one day to put me at the top of the list on Amazon and every other bestseller. So I guess that lesson is don't burn bridges. What happens, though, when someone does you? What happens when, uh, when someone does you wrong? How, how are we? We're still good. Okay. Yep. We're, we're right out. I have to be there by two. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Sorry to interrupt that no, no, with you, not folks. Not at all. Not at all. So uh, how, does, how, how do you, like, when you, when you do have a, a large offense, where do you go mentally to, or in your heart to be able to get yourself back to center to, to be okay? Because it, it sounds good, as like Mike Tyson said, right? Everyone has a plan until you get punched in the mouth. When you get punched in the mouth in business or in a relationship, a lot of times you want to go to the, the primal side. Well, I, I, we all like to go to the primal side. And I think the best thing to do at that point is to write that letter and don't send it mm. because you get it all out. Yeah. Uh, but make sure when you say you're not going to send it, don't send it. Because I was working at Blanchard, and I wrote a poison pen letter. I mean, a really poison pen letter. And I had no intention of sending it, and my assistant saw it and says, oh, I guess Harry wants this thing sent. Whoa. Yeah. So, Harry, I started... Yes, write it, write it in long hand <laughs> shredded afterwards <laughs> so i started the podcast because of my two kids uh, maddox and mckenna and uh, maddox uh, marches to the beat of his own drum he's a sports kid my daughter is in the uh, the arts so she's a, a singer and actress and um he's 12 she's 14 and i wanted them to never worship idols i wanted them to be inspired by icons like yourself so what advice would you have for maddox and McKenna, and if you could use both their names, it would be awesome. Well, to Maddox and McKenna, I, 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 just like I told my children, follow your dreams. What is it going to excite you to get you out of bed every morning and look in the mirror and say, today I'm going to be magnificent? Mm-hmm. It'll just set you off in the right uh, direction. And even with my kids, I, I notice with David and Rachel, sometimes the, the attitude's not there, but it doesn't last long. 
And I think that's it's okay to have a bad attitude, but recognize it and, and know that it's going to be short-lived and you're going to move on for it. No one's going to be perfect with this stuff. So that's what I think. Harry, I want to thank you so much because most of the time when you meet legends or heroes in your mind, you get close to them and you're, you wish you would have stayed at a distance. But you're, clo- you're better close up than you are at a distance and you're great at a distance. And I just want, I want to thank you for that because from the time that we got on the phone to the time that we get to spend here is just, it, it's, it's unbelievable. And this is exactly, you're exactly why I started the podcast because you are a hero of mine. I've got to meet you because of the podcast. And now my kids get a chance to be able to listen to someone who I grew up on and who, I mean, my kids are living a life because of your principles and me putting your principles in play. You gave them a great life. Well, and I appreciate it. You know, I, this would help me give my kids a great life. And uh, if I may, and uh, yeah. another thing, as a parent to a parent, uh, we think we raise good kids, my wife and I. And we did it because there were consequences. Mm. And t- today that's gone. And we said to our kids, you get a car when you're 16. You get a college education paid for. You could do extracurricular activities at school. Rachel was a peer counselor. David played baseball at Poway High. Uh, But you can't get in trouble, and you must maintain a 3.0 or better. And then my son goes, well, you only need 2.5 to get on the baseball team. I said, but we play by our rules. There we go. Consequences. (laughs) Consequences. <laughs> Harry, it's been an absolute pleasure. I want to thank everyone out there watching, listening. Subscribe on YouTube if you haven't already, because my son thinks I'm cooler. Um, also, too, if you want to experience the uh, the podcast live, we've got the Vibe Room. To have a person like a Harry at the Vibe Room, it's a, a live studio audience in a, um, in a 60s jazz club speakeasy in Salt Lake City that we do it. We just did it, and it's unbelievable. So that's the Vibe Room. Uh, thank you for rocking with the podcast. I appreciate every single one of you and helping us to get in the top 1%. All of our sponsors, you saw the new uh, commercial, which is Poppington's. My uh, son said that the popcorn is exquisite, and if it's not Poppington's, (laughs) it's just simply popcorn. (laughs) So I want to thank every single one of you, Harry. You're incredible. Better than advertised, my man, and you're advertised well, and you're officially off the hot seat. All right. There we go. You did it, great.